Today is Thursday, August 11th, 2016. We are at the University of New Orleans, and I will be interviewing Lawrence Baptiste, who is a, a musician in the city as well as uh, a historian himself. So the first thing I wanted to ask you as we start was, is it okay if we videotape our interview? Yes, it's okay. You can video. And then at the end, we'll be asking you to sign a release saying that we can use I'll this. Sign it. Okay, then we are, we are good to go. All right. In terms of just starting off, uh, what is your full name? Lawrence Elijah Baptiste. And when were you born? October the 20th, 1938. Where was, your, where, where was the home you were born into? Well, I was born at 1226 Gravy Street. Okay. And I stayed there until I was about nine years old. And then I moved two doors over. To 1232 Gravity Street, which I, let me just. You talking about talk some of the talk questions? At random? Sure. Oh, you want to question? Well, I know on? you talk okay, a little bit. Okay, I'll be able to put some stuff in there. Yes. Okay. Well, the second home, the second house that I moved in, when I found out later, it had been Benny Harvest Ballroom because they had two sides to it. One side, but well, they had two different families: my family and another family. The other family that lived on the condo side, their house, their, their inside looked like a ballroom. When you went in their house, there was a long hall, and you went all the way to the back, and you could go out a back door out into the yard. So I found out later that was Benny Harvey's ballroom. And I don't know how true this is, but I found out later this is where uh, the great bass drummer Black Benny was stabbed. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so, that, now how true that is, I don't know, but I read that in, later in a later book. That Black Benny, Black Benny had, was stabbed in that Benny Harvest Ballroom. Tell me a little bit about your family. Well, my grandmother came from Valdez, Louisiana, 1921. And everybody else after that was born here in New Orleans. They were very poor, and they moved to that area because that's where rent was cheap. And you know, basically that's it. My mother worked as a presser in, a, in the St. Charles Hotel. My stepfather worked as a truck driver for a coffee company, Dupree Coffee Company. And that's about it. On your first house, can you describe it to me? Like how many rooms were in that first house? That well, let's see now, we had the front room where my grandmother slept, second room, Third room. Let me see. What one, two, three, in the kitchen. They had about four rooms in the house. We had a a, a, a commode outside. It was outside, but it flushed. You had a tank that you pull the string and all that. It was right right in the heart of the city. <laughs> but it was outside, you know. Did, did did your neighborhood have a name? Did it was it called any particular name? Well, not really. It was the third ward. But if you want to describe it, you would say the front of town third ward, because you were going toward South Rampart Street, okay, or, or toward the river. But if you lived, say, back where LSU Medical School is right now, where the nurses stay in that back by LSU, you would call that back of town third ward, you know, because that's how New Orleans used to be: uh, uptown, downtown, front of town, back of town, and the lake and the river determined where, which way you were going that determined it. If you was going above Canal Street, you were going uptown. And then if you were going, say, like in Carrollton, you were going way uptown. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what was the dividing line between front of town and back of town? Uh, Claiborne Avenue. So everything on, yeah. the, everything on the riverside of Claiborne was, was, was going in front of town. Front of town. Matter of fact, uh, they had a club. That was a neighborhood back there. A big Big neighborhood, and they used to come to South Rampart Street to shop. South Rampart Street was the was the busy place. I lived about two blocks from South Rampart Street, maybe a block and a half. So I was there every day. I, I saw it all, you know, every day. But a lot of kids that lived way back across Claymont, they only got out there maybe once a week, like on a Sunday or a Saturday or something like that. But I was there every day. I, my grandmother would send me to the butcher shop. They had, they had many butcher shops grocery stores, dry goods shops, uh, 
So I was dealing with these people every day. You know, so I saw a lot of stuff. Matter of fact, in 1947, when Jackie Robinson came into the major leagues, every wooden post on South Rampart Street from Canal Street up to by Julia Street had a picture of Jackie Robinson on it. Every one that took a staple, something too. And that was uh, a, a bread company called Bond Bread. They sponsored that at the bottom of it would be Bond Bread. And even some of the uh, people that sold tailor made pants, they took advantage of it because I don't know where they got the glossy pictures from, but they got a glossy picture of Jackie Robinson and put it in the window next to the material. <laughs> <laughs> As though Jackie Robinson wore those clothes. <laughs> <laughs> where, did he, where did he appear when he came to town? Well, when he came, to, uh, let me see, did he come to, I don't think he came the first year because there wasn't enough uh, black guys in the league at the time. But I'm not sure, but I don't think he came the first year. But when Larry Dover came, uh, Harry Simpson came with the Braves, uh, even Benny Minoso. When they, as more and more African Americans got into the league, they did what they called barnstorming. They would come to the South after the after the season was over and play for us. I mean, there was a stadium back on uh, Carrollton and Tulane called the Pelican Stadium. Well, the older people call it the, the Hyman Park because that was the name of it before. Now the Fountain Blue Hotel is there now. But that's where Jackie used to play in that in that stadium, and the stadium would be f just overflowing with people. People would dress up. I remember my mother would dress up and have a big hat on and all that. You know, it, they'd go to see Jackie Robinson and the rest of the guys. I saw Jackie Robinson there. I saw the original Harlem Globetrotter clown Goose Tatum, because he was playing with the Indianapolis Clowns, you know, semi-pro baseball. At the same time, he was just with the Harlem Globetrotter. They had a little, uh, I don't want to miscall the guy's name, but it was a small person, you know, <laughs> you know, a small person with a big oversized catcher's glove. And they would put on like a comedy act between Goose Tatum and that. Satchel Page came with the Indianapolis Clowns. So that's you, what they would play. Do you remember what it would cost to get in there? No, because they was paying my way. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, but yeah. what was your uh, what was your mother's full name? Gertrude Anderson. Gertrude, Gertrude Washington. That was a that was a maiden name. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, she was paying the way, and my stepdad was paying the way. And eventually, her name was Gertrude Washington Anderson. You know, but um, so what happened? Satchel Page pitched against Jackie Robinson. We watched it. Uh, people was they had so many people in the stadium that it spilled out from the first row of seats out on the field. You know, that's how many people was there. And they stayed at uh, they couldn't stay in the hotels downtown, so they had to stay at the um, the Patterson Hotel. They had the Patterson, and they had another one up on uh, Howard Avenue. I forgot the name of that one, but it. Very large steps come down right where the overpass on Howard Avenue comes down right now off the bridge. That hotel was right in that area right there. Okay. Off of Julia Street. Julia Street. Yeah. Going back to your, your neighborhood now, when when were you old enough to just start walking around your neighborhood? Uh, they sent me to South Rampart Street when I was like nine years old. Because that's where, you see, in those days, you didn't have refrigerators. You had what they call ice box. And this ice man would come and sell you ice to hold your food. But people bought food almost every day and they cooked every day. Now the food might last one or two days, like that, but ice couldn't hold that food that long. So I went to Canal Street, I went to Raff South Rapport Street where the supermarkets were. You know that there's a place on South Rapport Street now called Italian Pie? Well, that was a supermarket. That was Jerome's supermarket. I used to go there. My grandmother used to deal with him. But I say deal because she had a book. And she would get stuff on the book. And then she would pay. Yeah. Uh, they had meat markets all up and down around Fort Street. Butchers, you know. And some would give you different deals. 
like uh, in order for to get the kid, you would the term lanyard. Right. Well, if you would send me out to this particular butcher, he would say, they knew my grandmother by name and stuff like that. They say, um, tell me I put an extra chop in, the, in, in there, you know. And he see they had three different cuts of pole chops. You had the center cuts and the stuffing pole chops, and you had the fat ones, you know, the ones that was the little cut. So he threw a fat one in there <laughs> as an extra one. Or they might give me a piece of candy or something, so I could come back to him. <laughs> you see, so, <laughs> so that that's all that kind of stuff went on uh, in, that, in the neighborhood at that time. And how many blocks was that from your house? About I only lived about a block and a half, maybe two blocks off of South Rampart Street. Okay. Because uh, when I left my house, I hit the Saratoga Street. The next street was South Rampart Street. You know, right next to the. <laughs> Pethian Temple, what they're building right now is a condominium. Mm -hmm. I used to walk right past that every day. But it was closed then at the time. What kind of, what kind of other businesses were there besides tailor shops and butcher shops on, on Rampart Street? Well, let me see now. They had, well, they also had bar rooms, gambling, <laughs> gambling rooms. <laughs> you know, like in the back of the Astoria, they had gambling. Um, they had a dance hall, but I never did go there. My aunt and them went because it was, I think they didn't have dance, it was called a TikTok. It was above their story. That was the dance hall, but, the, but I didn't go there because I was too young. My aunts went when they were girls, you know. Uh, but they had, I don't know, Buku Barbershops was on South Rampart Street. And another thing I did, and this was uh, basically supposed to be illegal, but it wasn't because it was lottery, what they call the numbers. And you have different companies you have. You would have the Pelican, you would have the Playhouse, the Blue Horseshoe, the Blue Eagle, you know, and stuff like that. And different owners own those companies. So I delivered for the Pelican to different people that play in numbers. And now, what would you I, deliver? A, a, a list. It was a, it was called a list. Uh, and let me explain that what it is. Every day, a vendor would come around. You would have like a tablet, and I don't know, uh, most people don't know what a spelling tablet is now because I don't think they have that in school anymore, or they do it on the computer, but a spelling tablet was a long piece of, a long tablet that you wrote your spelling words in, but he would use that with squares of paper with carbon, and now he would say, uh, okay, Mr. Kennedy, what you want? What numbers you want? You would say, I want five, uh, five, six, and eight, or something like that. He'd write it down. You say, and you say, I want it for a nickel. And then he would give you your ticket, and it would be on his book. And then he would go at about one, at three o'clock. He would cut off the book at about three o'clock, and he would go to wherever they're drawing the numbers. Now, sometimes he would draw the numbers at Jefferson Parish, at, 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 at the same place. It's a, it's a dance hall now, South Post Hall. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time, you know, but then in Seattle Mint, they had a place called the Jungle Inn. It was really a little gambling house. You would go in the, the Seattle Mint, you would go in the, in the Jungle jungle Inn, and they would have a lot of lottery vendors would be in there, people playing the wheel, they have a big wheel on the wall, playing blackjack, throwing dice, uh, playing whatever, you know. And it, was a, it was a gambling joint. That's why I was, I said, I wonder why they're making such a fuss about the casino here now, <laughs> when they always did have casinos, right? How, how much money could you make doing that? What, you know, what, well, would, what would you make doing it? Well, they would give me 50 cents okay. just for bringing it. But the vendor would get a quarter on a dollar. Every dollar he sold, he got a quarter off it. You see. And some of those guys who didn't drink or gamble, they saved their money. Some of them bought, bought property with that money. In fact, I talked to a man. He said he bought many houses just by being a lottery vendor. Now, now when you lived on... When you lived, um, you know, in your first house, what kind of groups would be going down the street selling things? Did you have oh. people selling vegetables? Oh, yeah, you had, peddlers all over the, you had peddlers all over the place. What were they selling? That's another thing. People was crying about the noise ordinance, right? They had a big boo ha here about noise. New Orleans has always been noisy. You know, the streets has all, especially in my neighborhood, they're always noisy. You would have the old gold man. He would come around, old gold, old gold. You would sell him your watches or your rings that was gold, you know. 
You would have the rag man. Would he be in a car or a horse? Walking. Walking. Just walking. walking. Yeah. Now the rag man might have a wagon. Most likely he had a wagon with a horse. The rag man. Or you might have a push a push wagon. But he would buy your rags from you. And he would sell them to the rag company. Um you had an umbrella man would come around and repair your umbrellas right there on the step. See like that umbrella I have right mm -hmm. there? If the spoke broke or something like that, you'd fix it right there on the step. Then you had the peddlers, the Buku peddlers, uh, selling uh turtles, rabbits, vegetables, one after the next coming around, you know. Then uh you had the stone cold man. Stone Cold, you burn it in your fire, fire head. You get, most most rooms had a fireplace in it. They didn't have heaters and stuff. They burn Stone Cold right there. You could get a large bushel of Stone Cold for fifty cents. Then you would get a smaller bushel for 20, 25 cents. Same thing with ice. You could get fifty pounds of ice for fifty cents. Then you'd get a fifteen cents piece of ice, which is smaller, you know. How was the How was the ice delivered? On a truck. A truck. Ice man. I, in fact, I delivered ice when I was like twelve. I had a, a job on a truck, making a dollar a day. <laughs> now, would you, how much of the money would you get to keep? If French Would you give to your mother? Well, I'd give her the four, and I'd keep a tree. Okay. <laughs> but at that time, you know, three dollars, you could get a, a a nickel Hershey bar. You could get uh, nickel Pepsi, 12 ounce Pepsi. I never did drink Cokes and 7 Up because Cokes and 7 Up was too cheap, uh, was too small. The only time I would drink a Coke or uh, 7 Up is if my neighbor next door would give me one. But other than that, I never would buy one. <laughs> so, because it was too small for my money. You could get um, some little cookies, plain cookies, like vanilla wafers almost, but they were larger than vanilla wafers, for two for a penny. And you take a nickel in there, you could get 10 of them. You know, you get a box root beer for a nickel. And man, you have a ball. You know? <laughs> now, when you first, now, did you have any brothers or sisters? I have, right. I have uh, Joan, Joseph, and uh, Missy. Yeah, Joan and Joseph and Raymond. I got three brothers and one sister. And you all lived in that same house? All in the same house. Mm -hmm. Okay. So were you the oldest, youngest, middle? I'm the oldest one in the whole family. The oldest grandchild. Oh man, I was before they came. I was like a king. My grandma, my I had my grandma, my mama. You know, I had my aunts, my, my mama, younger sisters. I was from one arm to the next, man. That's why I like women to hug me now. I guess <laughs> <laughs> I still hear somebody on, man. If my cousin them would come come from uptown, oh papa, they call me papa. Oh papa, come in. <laughs> when when okay, so when you in, in your neighborhood. Not only did you have the peddlers coming through, did you ever have anybody coming through selling record recordings? No, we had record shops on South Rampart Street. Okay. No, they didn't sell recordings then. But I tell you what they did have, uh, almost every little hole in the wall ballroom had a little band playing. Free, just walk in. You know, yeah. And that's how guys, I guess, you know, uh, develop themselves by playing in the little small ballroom and stuff like that. I played with an old man one time. He told me he gave Fast Domino one of his first jobs at the Club Crystal on, uh, this was downtown. This was in the Treme. The man name was Handy. You probably heard of the Handy Brothers. Sylvester Handy, Captain John Handy. Well, uh, Sylvester Handy and Sil, Sil Handy was a left-handed bass player. But uh, Sylvester Handy told me that he gave Fast Domino his first job. He was a guitar player and banjo player. Mm -hmm. And that's possible because you know, when I was coming up, I played with a lot of older guys, you know. They taught me how to, what to wear, how to do on the streets and all that, you know. And there, when, when, I had one question about Rampart Street before I come back to your, your immediate neighborhood. All right. Um, do you ever remember a store that would sell used Mardi Gras Indian suits? A number of people have told me about them. I never heard of that. Okay. Because Indians always made their own suits, you know, and, and I guess they broke the suit down to, to put on some another suit. But I never, in fact, I never, the Mardi Gras Indians right now is more visible than they ever been. They only was visible at Carnival time and St. Joseph night. Other than that, they didn't perform on the stages. 
Like you see them now, they didn't do that. I mean, they, they're more visible now, and that's good because now they could make a little money to help pay for all them suits, <laughs> all that, all those expenses and stuff, you know. Right. But uh, they're more visible now than they ever did. Did you have any in your neighborhood? I, Huh? Did you have any people who were masking in your neighborhood in the, in the Mardi Gras? Neighborhood? Yeah, I knew a man that, that masked as an Indian. Uh, but the, the famous Indian at that time, uh, when I was a kid, was a guy called Brother Tillman. He, they say he carried uh, two pearl hound pistols. <laughs> and they say he would shoot. So we all you know, knew about Brother Tillman. Did you ever yeah. see him? I never saw him. But I used to see the Indians passing on Franklin Street, I guess coming from downtown, like on a Mardi Gras day, mm -hmm. you would see them passing, you know, uh, coming from downtown or going downtown, you know. Now, back then where the Superdome is right now, Superdome wasn't always, well, you, know, you know that already, it wasn't always there. Uh, they had a bridge, they had a body of water back there called the New Basin Canal. And they had a bridge, they used to call it the Black Bridge. They used to cross that. I used to cross it going to my cousin's house on Thayer Street uptown and you cross over that body of water on that bridge. But some people claim that when the Indians would, would meet at that bridge, the uptown Indian and the, and the downtown Indian, they would get into a, a fight at that bridge. And, that, and I think one of them got, might have got killed at the bridge. What was the so, street that that bridge was on? Did around you, Magnolia, up in there. Because I've heard of the Magnolia Bridge and the Liberty that's, Bridge. That's, and I well, okay, that might have been one of them. Yeah, I, I, but I know we used to cross it. I don't know exactly what street it ran off of. Cause the Gerard Street graveyard was back that way too, and we used to pass that coming from school sometime, coming down. You know, uh, matter of fact, my uncle was buried in the Gerard Street graveyard, and man, we used to have fun with that. Cause the graveyard had clothes, I believe. He wasn't burying people in there anymore, and we'd get a kid right there by the gate <laughs> and push him in the graveyard. <laughs> And then we would break off and run. <laughs> but uh, at one time we passed that, they had a skull, right? Right inside the gate, you know? I don't know who messed with the skull, you know, or who done that, but it was right inside the gate, man. We pushed the kid up in there and run, you know? <laughs> now, so you would so you'd have been the first among your brothers and sisters to go to school. Right. And then and your first school was? A.P. Williams School. And how many blocks, I mean, how, how far away was that from your home? Missy, I, um, if you're half a block, you're another block, about a block and a half, that's all. On, on the first day, did your mother walk with you to take you? No, my stepfather brought me. Okay. And uh, I remember going, <laughs> and I was looking back, looking back. <laughs> he said, come on, you ain't got to worry about it. <laughs> so I, I went there, and once I got started and met all those kids, that was it. Because I used to like to play a lot, you know. So it, it wasn't no problem after that. And what was your stepfather's full name? John Anderson. John Anderson. Mm -hmm. Now, were you, were you nervous about the first day of school? Do you I remember mean, uh, anything else about it? I was it? nervous leaving home, but once I got in there and started talking with the kids and stuff, I wasn't nervous anymore, you know? Because <laughs> I, I told you I liked to clown and play, you know? So there you go. Well, before and I didn't have all those kids on my block. See, when, when I lived that, I lived on a, right across from that, uh, that, that jailhouse. They didn't have many kids. I only had one little guy on my block. And I, could, I wasn't allowed to run all around the neighborhood. I had to stay right there. So when I got, met up, went to school with all those kids, oh man, that was like heaven, you know. <laughs> so I, I'd play we, in that basement, you know, I'd, I'd show you in that basement right. right there. We would play running and hiding in that basement and all that, you know. <laughs> was there anything under there or was it all empty space? It was basically empty space because they didn't want us to, I guess, to climb on nothing and get hurt or nothing, you know. And they had a teacher on duty that would be out there, you know, and stuff like that. But we'd be running in that basement. It was dark, though. They might have a little dim light showing, you know, but it was dark down there. Could you, could you play under there if it was raining, or did they? Oh, yeah. We, we, it, it, was, it was covered, you know, because the school was on right. top of it. Yeah we, yeah, we could play under there, you know. But uh, we had a lot of fun at A.P. Williams School. And you said your mother had attended it. But she, when she went there, they had those uh, upper floors. You know, those floors, I think the school, I think the school caught on. Did you hear anything about a fire at that school? They were, I had heard about hurricane damage to the school. It might have been hurricane damage, but I thought they had a fire there. And then when they remodeled it, it took those upper floors off, off you know, because the school reduced. I think my mother was going there, she was going there up to about the sixth grade. But I went there, it was the fourth grade. 
Just, just first grade through fourth grade. Fourth grade, that's right. So I didn't need those upper floors then, you know, I guess. Now, do you remember any of your teachers there? Oh, yeah, I remember Ms. Watson. I'll tell you about her, the principal. Well, I'm going to be asking you about that in a minute. Ms. Jones. Uh, Ms. Jones was the one that sent that note home to get me, <laughs> so my mother came to the school and whipped me in front of the class. Well, tell me about the, what happened there. <laughs> Okay, well, I told you I like to play, all right, and make the kids laugh. The more they laugh, the more I would clown, uh, you know. So I got Miss Jones. I think, I think that was the second grade. I'm not sure. Miss Marks. They taught all these teachers I'm calling right now. I taught my mother, Miss Jones, Miss Marks, and they might have had another one because my mother used to call their names, you know. But she used to talk to, talk to. But anyway, Miss Jones um, would try to make me stop. And I would sit down for a while and I started playing again. So she sent a note on by a kid that I was cutting up in the classroom. So my mother came to school with a strap and she went to talk to Miss Jones, had me in there and stood me up in front of the class. And then she started whipping on me in front of the class. She said, I'll make them laugh at that. <laughs> so I sat down that whole year. I didn't have no problem after that, you know, but that whipping wore off. <laughs> <laughs> and when they wore off, I, 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 I got, I passed through the third grade, I did all right. When I got, oh, and back in those days, I have to back a little bit, little bit. Back in those days, they had A's and B's. You went from, I forgot which one that took you to the next grade, but if you was in first, first A, and when you got the first B in your pass, you went on to the to second. So, all right, I was all right until I got to the fourth grade. Then, then all the stars converged on me. What happened was my eyes started going bad. So the teacher told me to bring that note home, told my mother my eyes were bad, I needed glasses. I didn't want glasses, because they would call you four eyes. So I didn't want the glasses. And I would read a paragraph or read a few lines, and the, the words would just come together on me. I had to stop and clear my eyes. So the teacher said, oh, you just called those words earlier. Why you? And so I, I guess I couldn't explain to her what was happening, but she knew that. She said, you need glasses. But anyway, I didn't, I didn't wear my mother, but my mother was pregnant with my sister. And she was having a hard time with that pregnancy. So she didn't want, or she didn't have time to deal with me like she should, like she would have, you know? So, I'm to say all the stars came together on me, man. Plus, I had a teacher that was very soft. You know what I'm saying? She, did, she would say, sit down, sit down, like that. <laughs> man, I just had a ball. <laughs> Until the last day. I had a ball to the last day. So, while we was in there, we had ice cream and cake the last day of school. Poor car was on the desk. So I start thumbing through the cars. I said, you pass, you pass, and you pass. And when I got to me, they said, your child, no, you, you, your child has not been promoted to fifth grade. Man, I thought the world had come to an end. <laughs> I said, oh, man. So I'm going to sit down and put my head on my desk. So the guy said, man, what's the matter? You don't want no more ice cream? I said, no, man, I don't want nothing else. Because I just knew I was dead, man. I, my mama was going to kill me when I got home. But she was home washing on the washboard, heavy and pregnant, because we had a wash, we had the washing machine. Right? So I, guess, I, come through the, I come up in the alleyway crying. I was just crying coming through the alleyway. And I got in and she said, what's the matter with you? Why are you crying like that? I said, mother dear, I said, if you don't whip me this time, I said, I'll never do it again. And she said, do what? I said, so I showed her the card. And she, I must have had a, a guiding angel or something on my shoulder. Because she looked at me, and she looked at the card. And she didn't say nothing. She just gave me the card back. And man, I couldn't wait for school to open up. I said, oh, because see, that, that was a lesson in itself. You never make up for lost time. You never can make up for that. So. I couldn't wait for school, but I was, if see, if they had, but they stopped the A's and B's while I, while I was on summer break. If they'd have let me went back and been like a half a grade behind the fifth graders, 
Like, I, they'd been in fifth, fifth A, and I'd have been in fifth B. I could have caught them again. If they stopped it, then I'd have been up with them again. But they stopped it completely. So I had to go all the way through the fourth grade again. I made the kids who I was there with was a grade higher than me. You ever heard of Morris Jeff? Yes. Well, I should have graduated with Morris Jeff at Booker T. Washington. He graduated in 1956. I graduated in 1957. See, because me, he and I were the same age, and I would have been up with him. But I got kept back once. So finally, we're jumping ahead now, because you want to finish up town, right? Well, well. I, before we go, I just want to ask you that one question, the story you were telling me earlier about the, the, the principal giving you a talk, everybody a talk on safety. And oh, safety yeah, you want, you want that story? Okay. Yeah, I want that one too. Well, I had a, she, if I had her in the fourth grade, I never would have been kept back because she wasn't soft. <laughs> if I would have had Miss Watson, her name was Mammy Watson, if I would have had her in the fourth grade, I would have been kept back. But Miss Gary was, oh, sit down, stop now, and all that, you know. <laughs> but anyway, Miss Watson gave a, a safety talk. And uh, she, at that time, we didn't have those electronic bells. They had a hand bell, they rang, ding, 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 ding. ding. But if they wanted, if a fire drill or something the emergency, they would take the beater with their hand and make it like tick, 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 tick. So you knew it was something different. So anyway, she gave the safety talk at three, it was about 2.30, when three o'clock came, she said, now y'all go out and cross the street properly now. So here I go, the clown, I go down the steps and I get in the middle of Laola and Bonita and start singing Hey Bob Reba, you know, <laughs> and the kids were just laughing. Oh man, you better come out that street, you better get out the street. Hey Bob Reba, hey Bob Reba, your mama knows, your daddy knows. <laughs> so, Miss Watson was standing on that gallery, looking. She, ding, 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 come back here. I said, oh man, I just knew it was a disaster then, you know. So I get back there, she said, now didn't I just tell you how to cross the street? I said, yeah, Miss Watson. She said, well, why are you out in the middle of the street clowning with hey, Baba Reba? I said, Miss Watson, I, 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 I'm not gonna do that again. So she said, go down to the tree and bring me five switches and don't bring small ones. So when I went to the tree, got the tree, brought the switches back up to her office. She wrapped them up and beat me till those switches turned to threads. <laughs> Said, now, go across that street like you're supposed to. And I was in her room. When I went back to school for the fourth grade, I was in her room. Now, she, was, she, she used to treat me nice because when I was on vacation, she let me come work in the garden and all that during the summertime. And she gave me a few pennies, you know, nickels or so. She said, come clean, I want you to weed, take the weeds out of my garden and stuff. And I'd go down, she liked me, but she didn't play. Oh, so she didn't play. Mammy Watson was a man. She, she became principal of Phyllis Wheatley. When they built Phyllis Wheatley down right. on down on Dumaine Street, mm -hmm. she was the principal down there. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Now then, as you, as you, you know, what caused you to move to the second house? Not out of Trinity Treme, but you said you moved in, you know, two homes when you were about... Well, I was over there with my grandmother. Okay. My grandmother lived at 1226. I was born at my mother. But my mother moved out to another little house at 1232. So I, I stayed in there with my grandmother till I was like nine. I see my mother every day. In fact, my mother was taking care of me and everything. Cause my grandma was, was sick and she couldn't work. But I stayed with her every day. In fact, I called her mother, mama, just like my aunts. Now, I'm the only one in the family that called my grandmother mama like that. Like, the rest of them called her something else, mama or uh, something like that, a big mama. But I called her mama, like she was my mom. And I was calling my mama by her name. <laughs> in fact, I, I called all my aunts and uncles except for two of them. My older aunt by marriage and my older uncle, my mom's older brother, I called them Aunt Dorothy and Uncle Henry. But the rest of them, I called them by their name. And they didn't mind it because I listened to what they told me. I knew they was grown and I knew I had to do what they tell me, but it just was something I did. I call them like my Aunt Marie, I call them Marie, I, my Aunt Juanita, Juanita. <laughs> you know? 
but I didn't call my grandmother by her name. So my mama said, my mama said, okay, you're going to come over here and live with me now. My grandma, my grandma didn't say that, but I don't think she wanted to give me up. <laughs> so me and my brother, my, my grandma's sister had snatched my brother up. And she kept him until she got sick. When she got sick, then my mama had to take him. So my mama, my mama told my grandma, I'm going to take Papa too. They call me Papa, they call my brother man. She said, I'm going to take Papa with, with me over there too. And my grandma didn't say nothing, but I could see the look on her. She, she didn't take it like that. So I had to go there. So we were sitting down talking to my mama. My mama said, you know, it's not nice to call your mama by her name. I said, well, we're going to call you. I said, well, where they call him? My grandma and mama. So we settled on Mother Dear. So that's what we call Mother. That she, you know, for the rest of our life, we call her Mother Dear. But we was calling her by her name. <laughs> <laughs> now, in, in your neighborhood and even going to school, how would you hear information about hurricanes coming? And what were they doing? Only on the radio. Only on the, because I was in 1947 snow. And boy, you're talking about a bad snow. That was a bad snow. In fact, it had a straight shot at our front door. And we were in that house. You, know, they had a, you see, where the first precinct was, where we saw my grandmother standing in that picture. They, my, grand, my mama said, when she was a girl, there was a wall there, a big wall. And they used to hang in that yard. That, that, right behind those hedges, you see, they used to hang in there. But actually, uh, they had tore the wall down. They wasn't hanging there now. And I think they moved back to the parish prison, whatever they had to do for his death penalty and all that, back to the parish prison. But so anyway, that wind had a straight shot across that big, wide open space right out of our door, 1947. And man, our house was rocking. But we heard about it on the radio. You know, that's how we heard about it. And uh, snakes was falling off in the yard like bombs. Leaks coming down. My grandma was walking through the house praying back and forth, back and forth. And so she said, raise the windows a little bit like that. So we raised the windows. My uncle and all them was there because he couldn't go to work. And we had a big trunk with quilts because he used to make quilts. You know, you ever heard of quilting? Mm -hmm. He used to make them in the wintertime. He used to take he had rags on a big pole and he had fold a pole out and lay across the bed and they'd be sawing and stuff. And they thought the quilts were so heavy. If you got in one of those quilts, you'd be on like smothered. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, when that wind was threatening to push the door in, she told my uncle in to push the trunk right behind the door. But the way we, and answer your question, how we found out about it is on the radio. Right. Okay. We didn't have TVs and all that, you know, or the, or the newspaper. Or the two. Now, the, what, what, was, what were the boundaries of the, of the precinct station? What, what streets was that on? Well, okay, it was on Tulane Avenue. Okay. Uh, now, it's, it, it, they had a funny entrance because the, uh, the front door was like diagonally off of Tulane, like. It was on Saratoga and Tulane, but it, it wasn't directly in on Tulane. It wasn't directly on Saratoga. It was like diagonally on that, you know. And that was the front door. But now uh, this, that's that place looked like a medieval castle. It looked like something Dracula would live in, because the, the top of it had steeples and stuff, you know, big red buildings, steeples, and commonly what we call hobos, guys that ride the rails. We used to skate around there. We used to go around there on our skates. We used to get like a union bar of skates and skate because they had smooth sidewalk around there. Well, we said bank it. We didn't say sidewalk at that time. It was smooth banking around there. You know? Anyway, and they had hedges right on the side of it, and you could hear talking coming from the hedges. But that was guys that ride the rails was under the jail on cardboard, sleeping under the jail. And the police didn't say nothing. <laughs> See, that's why I guess they call them on the Big Easy. <laughs> those guys were right there on Tulane Street, and we used to get on our knees and look through the hedges, and you could see them under the jail. And they was, sometimes you hear them talking under that, you know. <laughs> now, whenever you had to leave the neighborhood, was it because they were they were tearing, they were demolishing? We were them? renewal. That's what happened. How did you find? How, how did you find out about it? And how how did your parents feel about having to move? Well, I, I guess see our landlord. Our landlord was on South Rampart Street. Uh, the Foytales, you heard, you heard of the Foytales? That was our landlord. I used to like to go pay the rent because I used to pay the rent in a pawn shop, in a lawn shop. 
and they had guitars and stuff all up on the windows, and sides and guns and all that, you know, and I'd be looking through all that stuff, <laughs> looking at looking at it, not touching it, you know, but uh, and I, they had a little window, just like in a regular pawn shop, I'd go there and pay the, pay the rent, you know, and Miss Foytel, Miss Annie Foytel, used to have her dresses made uh, next door to my house because my brother's in the name, that's her, his godmother, uh, Miss Luella was a great seamstress. She, I mean, she could sew, man. And if Miss Foytel wanted a dress or something that she wanted to go out in, she would come down to Miss Luella's house, and our house was right next door, at 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Luella, Luella let me in, Luella. <laughs> and Miss Luella would let her in, and they had an alleyway between our houses with a side door with steps. And Miss Foytel would be sitting right there by, because no, no air conditioning, see. They had the door open, Miss Foytel would be sitting right there by the cutting table. Miss Luella had a big cutting table where she'd cut out stuff, you know. And Miss Foytel would be sitting right there, and they'd be lifting that young Dr. Malone, Stella Dallas, <laughs> and all that stuff, and drinking Cokes and Seven Ups. But Miss, 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 uh, Miss Foytel was sitting right there until that dress was finished. Because she didn't, see, Miss Luella had a husband that worked at the Roller Belt. He was a cook at the Roller Belt. Mr. Lewis used to make pretty good money. And I used to go sometimes to bring him something. Miss Luella sent me to the Roller Belt to bring it to him. Or he wanted me to come bring something to Miss Luella. And he'd send me over there. I'd go right through the alley by the Roller Belt. I got an alley by the Roller Belt right now. Go up there and go tell the security guard, I got to see Mr. Lewis Blurenstein. And he said, we'll go on the third floor. And I go up. Elevator on the third floor, Mr. Lewis would be up there. He'd be walking around with a big cook hat on and all that, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but Miss Fletcher would sit there because Miss Luella would get up and go to the racetrack. You know, if she felt like going to the racetrack, she would get up from the sewing machine and go to the racetrack. Now, me and Krause was very familiar because Krause had a third floor that sold um, goods, you know, bolts of material and uh, needles and bobbins and all this. So it was like, like a store almost up on the third floor. Like some of these little stores right now that sell that stuff wasn't, wasn't that big. But anyway, uh, this girl would run out and she would call me. I'd be playing in the back. In the summertime, I'd be playing in the backyard or something. She'd say, come here, Papa, quick. Go inside and wash yourself up a little bit. Put your shoes and stuff on. But I'd be bad and all that, you know. So I want you to go to Krauss. So she'd give me, if she wanted goods, she'd cut a little piece, a little piece to give it to me. If she wanted thread, she might do the same thing, or bobbins or needles or whatever. And I'd run, run over there to Krauss. See, Krauss wasn't no one about two, two and a half blocks from me, or three, maybe three blocks away. But I'd, run, I'd cut right through. Uh, now, Saratoga Street ran this way by the Pepean Temple, but the, the, the other side of it would be way over here by the old ear, nose, and throat hospital. That's where the other side would be. <laughs> so. I'd run over there right quick and get on the third floor so the ladies knew me. You see, uh, what you come? What Luella sent you for now? You know, <laughs> I'd go there all the time. Now, were you were you uh, disturbed to leave your neighborhood? Were you sad to leave your neighborhood? Whenever you finally had to go. Well, yeah, it, I was I was disturbed, but I'm gonna tell you what the most disturbing part about that. When I moved into Treme, I moved on 822 North Bury Street, but I still went to school uptown. I went to Hoffman School. I was at Hoffman School when they, when they moved. We moved in 1950. And then I used to walk up to the Iverville Project and meet some guys that were still living around there. See, everybody didn't move at one time. They moved certain blocks and all that. So the guys, that's how I got to go to Booker T. Washington. Because I used to walk up past Booker T. Washington and he had a guy, the, the same guy, people that was the janitor to, to A.P. Williams. He was going to Booker T. Washington. He was older than me. He was going to Booker T. Washington. There was about three or four of us would walk up Claymont Street. And when he got to Errata Street, and I looked down there, and that big old school would be sitting out, you know. He said, I'm going down there, man. I said, I say, what's the name of that school? He said, Booker T. Washington. I said, oh, man. I said, I want to go there. <laughs> so he'd cut off. His name was Albert. He'd cut off and go back there. And so I kept that in my head all the time. I wanted to go to Booker T. Washington. But I used to walk up Claymont Street, and we asked me what I used to see on mm -hmm. the way walking. Right. And 
uh, before they built the overpass. See, the Claiborne overpass wasn't built at that time. They, they started building it when I was getting ready, almost ready to leave Booker T. Washington. That's when they started building it. Uh, we would get to right there, right where Pontchartrain Expressway is right there. They had, uh, the trains would cross the street and block the traffic. But they had a table right there in the middle of the street where they would turn the engine around. And sometimes the engine would be turning around and we had to stop and watch that. You know, I mean, you're talking about something to look at. The engine would get on that table and then turn it around and then run the cars back that way. <laughs> but that was on Claiborne Street. That overpass wasn't there. They had trees, they had oak trees running all the way up Claiborne from, say, like the Legion Field. Mm -hmm. They'd be running all the way up Claiborne, across Canal Street, all the way up. They had, they had oak trees, beautiful new ground. In fact, when I was in the Zulu, um, the first time when I was in Louis Armstrong, in 1949, our float broke away from the truck and ran up on the, uh, the neutral ground with the, 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 the little uh, curve was no bigger than that. The float hit the curb and capsized. And I slid right off and went down the street to my house. <laughs> <laughs> that was it for you, right? Yeah, that was it. It was about 5 o'clock in the evening anyway. But my uncle, that same guy on that picture right there, he, he, he got me in that parade. He put me in that parade. So that was, that was the Zulu Parade of 1949? 49, yeah, when Armstrong was king. And, and, uh, and you then at 50, I was on there too. I was, in, I was on a guy named William Poole's float in 50. Yeah. And when did you get to meet Louis Armstrong? On the basin, I, I tell you about the new basin canal. Mm -hmm. But that new that canal is right where uh, the Pontchartrain Expressway is now. When they dug that, when they filled that canal in, they built that Pontchartrain Expressway. But that the Zulu used to pretend that they was coming from Africa on a barge. They have a barge in the canal, and so my uncle told me, he said, "I must take you to see Louis, meet Louis Armstrong." I said, "Okay." And so we got on the barge. Armstrong was standing up there, and he said, "Louis." I want you to meet my nephew. Because they knew, you know, they knew each other. So Louis looked down and said, How you doing? <laughs> Shook my head. <laughs> did you, did, what did it mean to you then? Nothing too much. Just to know you were meeting another man at the time. Just another guy, yeah. But I, I knew he was something famous because when I used to go to the, uh, to the grocery store on Liberty and Bedita, he had made that record called Lucky Old Son. Well, the grocery store was on the corner. But right behind the grocery store was a little bar room. And all the guys used to hang out on that corner. We used to hang in that bar room. And Louis Armstrong used to hang there himself on that, on that corner. And they, they just wore the lucky old son out back there, yeah. And they always talk about him, you know. Now, now when you moved to Treme, d describe that little area you were in then, because I understand you were right, you were right, you, the, the San Jacinto was right. Now, nah, at Treme, you know I play music, I play drums. But how I started playing drum was not by uh, older musicians. It was by Warren Eastern Band. Uh, we used to go to parade every night. My mother, used to, my mother was crazy about parades and stuff. Matter of fact, she used to dress uh, shrouds, uh, baskets, fans, and stuff for a bunch of guys in the Jolly Bunch parade. Jolly Bunch was the largest social aid and pleasure club at that time in the forties. And even all, all the way up to about maybe the 60s, Jolly Bunch was the biggest thing going. Uh, they came from back there by the uh, University Hospital there. That old, you know, uh, I think, uh, what's that street? Bolivar, back in Bolivar Street, back up in there somewhere. The Tulane Club. Right. That was their den, like, you know. But anyway, I met musicians when I got to the Treme. That's when I started to meet you know, real flesh guys that played music because they were still, gang of them still in the Treme. But the older guys uptown had all died off. My mama, my grandmother knew, um, what his name is, uh, he had the Tuxedo Brass Band. My grandma was friends with his wife. Um, Andrew Morgan, was Andrew Morgan in one of them? The Morgan, Casimir, Casimir brother. Yeah, she was uh, friends with, I think his wife name was Miss Camilla. My grandma was friends with her. Herman Sherman came from up there. He had the tuxedo brass band. But I didn't meet Herman until I got downtown. I never did know Andrew Morgan, you know, because 
most of those older guys had passed off the seed. Now, I used to see them in, when they had made up uh, uh, jazz bands on Rampart and Bedita. A lot of times they would make up on Rampart and Bedita. The bands would form, you know, and I used to see them, but I didn't know them. You know, because kids in my days didn't run up to people, uh, older people or men or nothing, and <laughs> start talking to them. <laughs> were you stayed were, back that, you know. <laughs> were, you, were you fascinated by the bands, or, or was it just another part of your neighborhood? Did well, that was just, that just, I grew up with that. It, it, it just was there, you know. But when I went to see uh, the Mardi Gras parades, and one of these and band was passing through, that was kids. And, you know, kids want to follow <laughs> other kids, you know. And little boys would pass there, put it up, put it up, put it up, put it up. I said, well, I want to do that. You know, and I come home and my grandmother had an old chair with some dials in the back of it that broke. I took them out and started beating on the old tub, you know, to try to get that, that cadence. I finally got it. We finally got a drum. But that was way when I was 13 years old when I got the drum. But I had been beating on stuff way before that. <laughs> did it, how, how did the drum come about? Did you, you know, did you just keep asking your mother for one or did she knew you loved it or wanted she it? She knew I loved it. And, uh, uh, she and when I when I got was able to put that cadence down, she said, "Oh, you like it that much?" She said, "I'm gonna get you a drum." So they went to World Line and bought me a thirty-eight dollar drum, which I paid for myself because we only paid two dollars, <laughs> two dollars on it every month or so, you know. When I was shining shoes on Barone Street, and I finished paying for it. Yeah, but I got that. I got this, the shell right now at home. The storm, the storm got to it really because they had ten feet of water in my yard, right. and it got into my garage and got to the, got to the drum. I need to so, so now, when did you go to McDonough 41? 1951, 52, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, I, I left when I, I, oh, he was asking me how I felt about the neighborhood. I had to move. Right. Okay, well, I went to uh, Hoffman School in the fifth grade, walking uptown, and when the boys all left, then I started catching the streetcar to go up there. And the sixth grade, well, I said, well, I'm downtown now. I'm going to go to school downtown. So I went to Craig school in the seventh grade, but Craig stopped teaching eighth grade. So I had to transfer over to 41. 41 taught seven and eight. And then I left 41 and went to Bell for one day. I only went for one day. Cause I had said I wanted to go to Booker T. Washington in the ninth grade, but I followed the guys from 41 to Bell. And when I got over there, you hear the soldiers talk about a flashback? I had a flashback. They was making so much noise in that classroom. And I was sitting toward the back, and he was throwing spitballs, and the teacher was talking, and I could see her mouth moving, but I couldn't hear nothing. Then something told me, he said, you better get out of here. Because <laughs> you know, he was, he was kept back before. He said, you better get out of here. <laughs> you got away. Your mama let you get away that time. But she ain't letting you get away this time. The next day, I said, Mother Lee, I'm going to Booker T. She said, I always, he always said you wanted to go there. I said, well, I'm going to Booker T today. <laughs> so I got on that street call and went to Booker T. <laughs> yes, indeed. I wouldn't stand down there with all that. Now, did you have your, well, well, tell me a little bit about your, your, your backyard and, and trying to learn your rudiments. Was that when you were at McDonough 41? Or, yeah, I was downtown then. Okay, Because right. I, I had started with Yvonne Bush. She was our music teacher at 41. And I had started learning what a quarter note was and all that kind of stuff. And so I'd be on the back with my, on the backyard with my ruler bank elementary, beating on, you know, that, 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 that. And next door, they had a, a dance hall called the San Jacinto Club. I don't know if you might have read about that or not. Big stars used to come there. Ray, I saw Ray Charles there when I was 16 years old. Um, Ella James, all of them used to come. Bunny, Buddy Johnson, sister Ella Johnson, all of them practice. So I'm sitting back there. Dave Matham used to practice there all the time. In fact, some guys from the Preservation Hall, uh, George Lewis, never cut records in there. I was there when he was cutting the record. But anyway, so I'm sitting on my steps, practicing my, my rudiments, band strike up. I say, oh man. <laughs> the book go over here. <laughs> I'm taking my stick like I'm riding a cymbal or something. <laughs> what, what separated the club from your yard? Fences. They, they, Just, so was, you, you got to see where, where, Actually, where my yard was, that was the hotel part. People lived. They had a, a, a great 
blues singer around here in New Orleans, Larry Donnell. His, his yard, his, his window was right above my yard. Larry Donnell, you know. If he got records, you probably heard Larry Donnell on records, yeah. But anyway, his, his window was right up there. So uh, soon it strike up, I put the book down and start trying to do what they did, you know. Could you see in from your backyard or just see the back of the place? What, did, what was well, your I could view see that they, they had a series of windows. Matter of fact, when a great star would come there, there are guys that would be all around the block trying to jump in to go in those windows. So those windows would be open. See, they didn't have air conditioning. And they would jump over people's fence to get in that alley to go through the window to sneak in the dance. So they had to post security guards and stuff to keep them from sneaking in the dance, you know. But uh, I, I could see in the window, but I couldn't see the band because the band was further up. Right. But uh, when I got big enough, I went in there, you know. The same guy who owned that, owned the house that I was living in. But he sold the house to my uncle. And what was the name, what was his name? Uh, his name was Beansy, they called him Beansy. But he was Fourier. Yeah, he, his house, matter of fact, right now is right next to Dookie Chase. Oh. That's his house. But he's long gone, long dead, sure. you know, yeah. But then, so you would, you would, you would hear the band at almost, I mean, so any time of day or night, you'd probably hear music. Oh yeah, I could hear the concerts and all that. Yeah, I could hear it right out on my back steps. You know, I, I lived upstairs and I would be on my back step listening at them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, they all they had clubs. Now the Trimmy had all kind of clubs around there. You know, where bands would play. In fact, uh, I used to go to a place called Piku's Ball, and they would let you in if you. Were, I was kind of big for my age. I was like seventeen. And I would go in P. Cool's ball. And uh, James Andrews' grandfather and grandmother, trombone shortage people, would be behind the bar in P. Cool's ball. Mm -hmm. And he was a guitar player, James' grandfather. You know. And sometimes James had an uncle that played with Fast Domino. Called him, they called him Papoose. His name was Walter Nelson. And he would be in town with Fats. So sometimes he would be in the bar. Because I was his mother and father behind the, you know, behind the bar. Mm -hmm. And the old people say, Piku, uh, say, uh, Papus played caravan for us. And so he would get his daddy's dick off, guitar down, and start playing caravan, you know. <laughs> but you, so, so when you, you, you attended McDonough 41, when you were living in Tremay, then you moved, then you went to Bill one day, then went to, to Booker T. Washington. Right. And you would take the, the streetcar there. Right. Okay. The, the South Claymont Streetcar, running on the canal. He had a canal in the middle of the South Claymont at that time. A big old, deep, like you see in Metairie, mm -hmm. but they had that on South Claymont Street. Streetcar's going to run on the side of it. Sometimes I say, one day the streetcar going to fall over in that canal. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you, did you get your drum before you had Miss Bush or after you got had Miss Bush? I got it, uh, right at, basically at the same time, I guess. Because when I started taking music, I was playing on books. But I got the drum at the same time, and I started bringing the drum to school. But the first thing I ever played, the first concert she ever had me on was on bass drum. We had a Christmas concert, and we held it in the hallway, because the hall was real big, and the students would come. And uh, Ms. Bush had me playing the bass drum. <laughs> and, well, um, and then after Booker T. Washington, you, you, you graduated, you said in 57? 57, yeah. 57. I should have left there in 56. That was a, uh, when I first, I couldn't get in the band when I first got there, I wasn't good enough. They had other guys, so you had to wait your time, because they had guys that was much better than me and stuff like that. So when I finally got in, I never forget the first big concert we had for the students. You know, you've been in the auditorium because you got it put on the National Register. Uh, I think in auditorium, must have held about, what, a thousand people or more? So, Mr. Sashery, I was only Sashery this time, he put me, a guy named Melvin Prevost on the other side of the auditorium, and he had me on this side with claves. Melvin Prevost had maracas. And we was playing a Latin tune. And I was standing like you the student, I was standing about this far from the first student. And I hadn't looked up yet. But I would just <laughs> and man, when I looked up and saw all those people. My knees started <laughs> knocking. <laughs> that was the first big stage I was ever on, man. Mm -hmm. But you got to start somewhere. And then, <laughs> then right after after um, you, you you completed your work at Booker T. Washington, did you go into the service then? Not right away. Uh, I went into service that 
that same year, basically. But uh, actually, I worked for a while until I got laid off. It was a recession then. Uh, president Eisenhower was the president, and it was a recession. And so the guy told me, see, I got to lay you off because I got men here, I got families and stuff like that, you know, and I was only 18, just had time, mm -hmm. you know. And so I was looking for a job because I wasn't used to sitting around. And uh, the, the recruiting sergeant had been running behind me to join, calling me up, I'm joining and all that. But I wouldn't, and it might be a good thing that I did go, you know, because I probably would have been still scuffling around here yet. <laughs> So anyway, uh, I went up one morning looking for a job. I used to go out every morning looking for a job. I came back to Camp, camp and Canal, and I looked over there. I saw the custom house. And I said, why don't you go see could you pass the test? So I went over there, and I said, I just come to see. I said, I don't want to join. I just come to pass the test, see if I can pass the test. He said, yeah, but they give you the test. So I guess they, they wanted me to get me in there so any kind of way, you know. <laughs> so I got in there, and I took the test. He said, you did all right on the test. He said, what you doing? I said, I ain't doing nothing. He said, well, look, uh, why don't you just go on and sign up <laughs> and get it over with? I said, okay. So I signed up for three years. Man, I went home and told my grandmother that I had signed up to go to the Army. My grandmother liked to faint it. <laughs> she called my mother up at work. My mother left work and came home. I said, you go back down there and tell them you ain't. <laughs> I said, no, I, said, I can't do that now. So I went. That was it. And I met my wife. I was on the wrong train on the way to Cleveland. <laughs> yeah, it was on the wrong train when I met her. Now tell me, before you know, we were coming close to the end now, but I want to ask you to tell me a little bit about your neighborhood when you lived in Treme. Okay. Like, like just as you would walk around it, what were, you know, what were some of the places that you would see or notice? What stood out to you when you moved there? Well, for one thing, it was a, it was a difference. The Treme was a different kind of neighborhood than Uptown. You had a lot of what, quote, unquote, Creole people in the, in the Treme, you know. Um, and you know, that, that brings up like a mostly majority Catholic, because I was Baptist and Catholic, really. But majority Catholic, when I'm when I went to grade school, when it was time to go to catechism, grade school was just about empty out. It'd be just about, well, I had a catechism book and my grandma had bought me one from St. Catherine on a, uh, on Tulane Street, but I never did go to catechism. But I knew the prayers from the, the book. But uh, what happened, the school was just about empty out. Almost all the kids would leave. You might, three or four of us might be left in each classroom, you know, who wasn't Catholic. You know, that, the Catholic Church in Treme was a, was a that, you know, the Treme was just full of Catholic people. They had Protestants down there too, but mostly it was Catholic, you know. And uh, that one thing, and then people down there used to speak a lot of Creole. Uptown, you didn't hear Creole that much. You might hear one or two words or something like that, but down there, people say, oh, I see it. They had, matter of fact, you had a, a lady and a, and a brother on my block. And he, he would pass and he would speak, uh, good, good night, good evening. But when he got to his sister, they would speak the whole conversation in Creole. Uh, a man used to shine his shoes lived across the street from me. He, had, he and his mother had come from Crowley. And uh, they used to speak Creole all the time, he and his mother, in, in, in the house, you know. Uh, that was one big difference right there. Sure, sure. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, it, it, it even did, uh, sometimes they cooked different down there. Uh, basically, we cooked the same thing they cooked uptown too, but downtown they had other little things they did like the like kala. You heard of Kalai? Yeah. Kalai is a rice cake that, like when they have um, a prayer breakfast for the kid that made his communion or something like that, they might cook up a, cook up, cook up a gang of Kalai for them. That's like a rice cake that's sweet. Like, and uh, sometimes they call them veil Kalai. They had uh, wrapped in jelly or jelly was inside or something like that, you know. It was a rice cake. Now, my grandmother used to make rice, but it was rice custard. Like in a pan, they made rice custard and stuff like that. Huh? What was the favorite food your grandmother would cook for you? Well, but my grandma coming from North Louisiana, she didn't particularly like red gravy. But she would make nice brown gravy, stewed chicken. She would cook turtle, 
you know, they call them Kawain. And they cook Kawain downtown too. Managed to pass on a truck selling them. You know, they be in a cage. You got to pick out which one you want. Uh, yeah, uh, she cooked sweet potatoes. You ever heard of coon? Mm -hmm. She cooked coon and sweet potatoes around it. Rabbit. Who would, who would clean the coon? They did. Oh, my grandma and him. I, I can't cook nothing and sit right there and watch everything. <laughs> All I was waiting for to get finished, you know. <laughs> I can't cook a thing, man. Now, my mother, being from here, when well, she was born in the country, but she came here as a baby, she dealt with a lot of red gravy stuff, you know, like uh, Italian stuff. And uh, my grandma cooked nice bell peppers too, and all that, you know. But my mama would cook all my mama cook cook, cook, cook cook all that. She could cook what my grandma would cook, and the Creole style. She cook all that, yeah. Now, were there there were Italians in your neighborhood uptown? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uptown, yeah. Uptown was. You wouldn't have thought that they had segregation laws the way uptown was. Because you had Italians, you had uh, blacks, you had uh, what else? Uh, Jews, fairly Jews, East European Jews. Uh, most of those little shops on South Rampart Street was owned by European Jews. Most of them, the tailor shops and all that, and they all worked together. Like I used to go bring a lottery list to a black family called the Grisbys. They had three sewing machines, and those machines would be humming. Oh, they. Mm -hmm. That's because those tailor shops that would sell your pants didn't have alteration shops in their shop. So they had to bring them to Miss Grizzly or to the Eagle Tailor. They had another company, a black company called the Eagle Tailor, where they did cleaning and pressing and alterations. And that would be humming. And, and the, I would be in there with Miss Grizzly and them at the counter. I was already, you know, a kid, but guys would be running in. Miss Grisby, I need this one for one thirty. I need this one for three o'clock. You know, and and Miss Grisby would be just sitting there somewhere. <laughs> now, now what, what was your first experience with with segregation or with racism? Like, when did you first? What, you, what did it first hit you that this is this is the way it is? Well, was there an incident that happened now, when you were little, or yeah, I saw several incidents, but. Like I say, about people living so close together. My aunt lived in a, in a yard where I had to go to the alley to get to my aunt's house. But in the front was a Caucasian family. And they would be in and out. Mostly Miss, Miss Pauline, the Caucasian leader, would be in my aunt's house. They'd be sitting down there drinking coffee and all that, and they knew me by name. So to tell you the truth about it, all those people I knew never called me out of my name that I could remember. They never called me any kind of, you know, name, my, my name. Now, the police might do it. The policemen did it. Uh, in fact, I saw the policeman beat up a black man on uh, Saratoga. And, and you had asked about those parameters of the jailhouse. Right. All right. Well, Saratoga Street was a regular street. It wasn't a wide, two, like, like Laola is down there now. It was a regular one, one lane street. Uh, and it ran from Uptown to Canal Street. The jailhouse was right on the corner of Saratoga Street. When you came out the jailhouse, you could walk right down the street past the Pythian Temple on Saratoga Street. Okay, this man was between two groups of policemen. And they, they had a thing, a little leather belt like thing called a blackjack, where the police would use it to hit you with. He would run from one group. He must have been a drunk or something, because he looked like he had been drinking or something. He had run from one group, and they would hit him. Then he'd turn around and run to the other group. Now, I'm witnesses as a little boy. All of us were standing on the corner. My mother, I don't know if my grandmother came down there, but I was standing there, and my brother, and some other people standing looking at this. And he would hit him, and he'd run back to the other group, back and forward, was, and they was laughing. He was having fun, punching him and stuff. So when he ran back toward the jailhouse to the other group, they hit him with the blackjack in the head, and blood jumped out. And my mother screamed. When she screamed, then they grabbed him and took him to the jail. And then they said, all I won't say on the screen what they said, but they said, oh, you get off the corner, you know. 
<laughs> it was directed at you all. Yeah, so we had to go back home. Yeah. But that's, I witnessed that. Uh, the only other time I knew there was some kind of difference was, you know, I lived right there on um, the first time, because you asked me about the first time I had a difference. I was looking out my door. Uh, we had shutters, you know, the shutters like that. I was laying in the door, my mother was standing outside, and we lived about two and a half blocks from Charity Hospital. And people used to pass our house all the time, going back and forth to Charity Hospital. So I'm looking out my window right there, out my little door right there. My mother was standing outside. So a little Caucasian girl jumped up on a step, because kids like to play on steps and stuff, you know. And a beautiful little girl. And so when she jumped down, you know, she looked, I said, Mother there, I said, look at the little girl on the step. And so the little girl looked in at me, you know. I said, oh, Mother dear, I'm going to marry her. And my mom would say, boy, you can't marry her. She said, that's a white girl. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first time I knew something was wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did, but did your did your mother or grandmother ever talk to you about how to stay safe? You know. Oh yeah, how, yeah, how yeah, yeah know always. Which, how to, you know, where not they, to go? Or how? Yeah, they told us how to handle ourselves when the police stopped. You see, uh, they say, tell them what they want to know. If you didn't do anything, don't run. Uh, you know, like stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's how we, you know, say like when they killed Emmett Till in Mississippi. My mother got took me, and my brother, and said, look. Because she knew I like to clown. See, I like to play. She said, I don't want y'all going out here clowning and playing around because you know they killed that boy over in Mississippi. So, nothing I must do. <laughs> Walking on South Ram or North Rampart Street. And my little brother, he didn't like to play. He, he was a kid, he didn't like to, you know, foolishness. So he liked to play. So, I'm walking down the street, and he's four years younger than me. So, we walking down the street. I see, I see what my brother said. This ain't no Tallahatchie County, you know, <laughs> like that. I was, <laughs> he said, boy, you better be quiet, be quiet. You know, mother dear told you. <laughs> I said, look, this ain't no Tallahatchie County. I said, I can see what I want. So <laughs> when he got home, he told on me. <laughs> My mother said, didn't I tell you? Don't go out here playing around. <laughs> I got a behind with me for that. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, but, it, but uptown was not... And I don't want to look, that, look through it like rose-colored glasses, but people got, really got along because they knew. You saw these people every day. Yes. And that's why I was saying that if, if they were integrated a school, say like Craig School, or even 41, you know, where people saw it. Because I used to play with boys from the Ivanhoe Project. There was Caucasian guys. See, they had two playgrounds, Lehman, Lehman on the lakeside and Lehman on the riverside. The one on the riverside was for Caucasians. The one on the lakeside was for the guys out of the Lafitte Project. We used to play in all of them. <laughs> and the police used to run us out, out the one on that side, but he got tired of running us out the water and bother us anymore. But sometimes the guys at the project, you know, the Caucasian guy would come in there and play, and we thought we would play with them. Mm -hmm. You know, plenty of times we did play with them. So, you know, you, when you see people all the time and you get to know them, Things are a little different. That's why New Orleans is like, I guess New Orleans is uh, schizophrenic. Because, you know, you couldn't sit in front of the screen on the bus. You had a, a, when you get on the bus, they had a screen for colored patrons only and for Caucasians, all right? Buses was much smaller than they are now. We'd be on that bus, Africans and Caucasians would be almost kissing. You know, that's how crowded the bus would be. And, you know, it, it, they would pack, you would pack that bus up. And, man, but you couldn't sit down, but you all up against people mm -hmm. on the bus. <laughs> so, that's what I say, it's schizophrenic, man. You, 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 you know, it's, they, they had laws and stuff that was stupid, in a way, mm -hmm. you know. Because the people was living, by, I guess by New Orleans being like it was in the beginning. And the, and the housing pattern was like it was. It just carried over, you know, where the neighborhood stayed basically integrated, mm -hmm. but the laws was segregated, yeah. you know, yeah. Well, I guess that's about all we'll be doing today, but, I, but I, I was looking up, the first time I spoke to you was on 
June 11th of uh, 1995, I think it was. All right. I caught you right before you were at the Riverwalk with your band. Okay. And, it, yeah. and, and that's when we talked a little bit about Miss Bush and about what yeah. you learned from her at McDonough 41. Yeah. Yvonne Bush lived on, uh, what is it, St. Peter Street? I think it was St. Peter Street. Or that. St. Anne or St. Peter, one of those. But I didn't know she lived down there because I was too poor to take private lessons. But they had guys going down there taking private lessons from them. You know, some of those same famous guys was taking private lessons from Miss Bush. Right. But I didn't. I didn't take I didn't take a private lesson from nobody. Basically, <laughs> I, we didn't have no money to take no private lessons. <laughs> most of my stuff is self-taught, mm -hmm. except for the little notes Miss Bush taught me, you know. But most of my stuff is self-taught. Mm -hmm. I'm from listening and learning and playing with records and stuff like that. And then my last question is, what was your first professional job? What was the first job you got paid for, meaning? M music? Yes, music. Oh, I don't know I remember that. Because they had a guy here named Brian Finnegan. He's dead now. I'm sorry, I don't know. One of the, uh, what, the internet or something like that. Brian Finnegan, he's just much younger than me. But I worked with him and got paid. And I don't remember what it was. But I, he had a band called the Magnolia Jazz Band. Okay. And I worked with him. But I played George Lewis's funeral. That wasn't a paid job, though. I was in the third band. He had three bands in that funeral. And I was in the third band. I played in George Lewis's film. That was the first film I ever played. Cause I didn't have a drum strap, I had a rope. I didn't have a cap. You know, it was a bunch of Europeans, myself, and it was a pickup band. The Olympia band was the number one band. Olympia was, was the, the head band of that, you know. Then they had uh, Percy Humphrey and them was, uh, what's that, the, uh, Excelsa or something like that? Uh, not Excelsa, Eureka. I think so. Yeah, yeah second, yeah, but we was a bunch of, uh, Pickups, the third man was. Okay. Lars Edegren was in it. Ernst Kellen, uh, Thomas Sankton. That was all for George Lewis's funeral. George Lewis's funeral. He's buried in McDonaldville, across the river. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all. That's that's all we'll need today. Right. You know, okay. that'll close it down. Okay. okay. okay.